Colleagues uh, should take their seats. Uh, we will start uh, soon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in the next uh, one and a half hour, we are going to discuss one of the very important and uh, complicated topics, which is the, also one of the legacies of the Cold War, the case of Afghanistan, conflict of Afghanistan, peace and reconciliation process in Afghanistan. We have very distinguished uh, fellow guests in this panel. I'm going to introduce very briefly our uh, colleagues, uh, starting from my left side, uh, Dr. Dawood Muradian, who is a very well-known uh, fellow. Uh, he served in a very senior positions in the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and he's running a very uh, well-known uh, and well-reputed center by the name of Afghanistan Strategic Center, studying or study center that usually launching a series of uh, talks on peace and security in Afghanistan. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Anwar Olak Ahadi, also a very well-known politician, a well-known figure of uh, Afghanistan who has been running several senior and high-level positions uh, after the fall of Taliban regime, particularly during the President Karzai as the uh, finance uh, minister and also commercial minister, and he was the one who brought a lot of reforms in terms of uh, many reform in Afghanistan, particularly after the collapse of the Taliban regime. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Farooq Azam, who is also a very well-known fellow. Uh, he has been served also in very senior positions in the Mujahideen time, and uh, he is the author of uh, several books on different topics, and he's also uh, closely engaged on Pogwash activities since few years, and he's a well-known peace activist also. We have uh, Mr. Rostam Shah Mohman, Ambassador Rostam Shah Mohman, who is a very great friend to Afghan nation, who has been served as the commissioner for refugees, Afghan refugees in Pakistan for many years, and supported Afghan refugees from humanitarian's point of view, and he's a very close friend to Pagwash and member of Pagwash, and has been supporting peace initiatives since several years in Afghanistan. We have uh, Madame uh, Rabin Rafael, uh, uh, Rafael, a very close, a very distinguished uh, colleague to Pagwash. Uh, she has a lot of knowledge, particularly on our neighboring country, Pakistan, and South Asia issues. And she's also been very supportive to Pakwash initiatives uh, since few years, uh, particularly when we launched some dialogues with uh, Afghan politicians, Afghan figures outside of Afghanistan. She actively took part on that. And we have the honor right now to have her in this discussion also. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the complicated case of Afghanistan, which has different or several dimensions, external dimensions and internal dimensions. The internal dimensions of the conflict, which is more or less focusing on suffering on, Af on Afghan people, which is causing big disasters. IDPs, internal displaced people, high level of civilian casualties. In the past six months, the United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan's report shows that around 3,500 innocent civilians, men, women, children, lost their lives or injured. Our data from 2009 up to 2017 shows that around 50,000 Afghans, men, women, children, uh, they lost or injured, uh, they lost their life or they injured during the conflicts. And unfortunately, the level in the number of civilian casualties is increasing every year. It's not decreasing, it's increasing. These uh, conflicts in different parts of the country in growing of new types of uh, uh, fighters, particularly 
presence of ISL and expanding of ISL from the east part of the country to the north part of the country right now. It caused a lot of obstacles for reconstruction projects, for the economic growth, and also for the, uh, particularly for the business and trades with, uh, within the country and also with the Central Asian countries, including Pakistan. From the external point of view, the conflict uh, also affected for uh, growing up the new types of radical groups, uh, which uh, Paolo also mentioned. Uh, ISIL is one of the examples. In the past six months, according to some reports, around 1,000 fighters of ISIL have been killed by drone attacks or military operations in the East region or some other parts of the country. I'm not going to, to explain all the aspects of these dimensions. Uh, I would like to give the floor to our distinguished panelists. Uh, first, I would like to start by Dr. Muradian, who I'm sure has, or maybe Dr. Sabahadi, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I think I'll skip uh, an introduction, and I'll go straight to the uh, current issues. And I think uh, the most current issue is that uh, last Monday, uh, President uh, uh, Trump announced his uh, uh, Afghan policy. And I think it's a major event uh, in the development of uh, Afghan conflict, or uh, hopefully the resolution of Afghan conflict. Uh, uh, well, uh, the immediate reaction, at least in the West, by lots of commentators was that uh, uh, they criticized uh, the, the policy, that it was uh, um, probably uh, promoting war, and that either it was not comprehensive or that it was inconsistent, uh, etc., etc. Uh, of course, there were some dissenting view which supported it. Uh, uh, I should say that I thought it was a strong statement. Uh, I thought it was a strong policy. I think it was uh, uh, a lot of deliberation uh, went uh, uh, before formulation of this uh, policy. Uh, contrary to some of the critics, uh, I think it was quite consistent too. Uh, 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 and uh, I, I also should say that I think it was quite professional. It is not something that uh, politicians would have recommended, uh, given the state of public opinion in the United States and even his major uh, advisor just before he announced this uh, 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 policy, Mr. Bannon, uh, I think uh, he listened more to professionals, i.e. to the generals and to the strategists, to the military strategists, than he did uh, listen to, to uh, public opinion. Uh, I think this is in contrast to what uh, Mr. Obama did. I think Mr. Obama's uh, surge policy and then withdrawal uh, forces and then announcement of a deadline for withdrawal that was pr very much politically uh, uh, motivated and I think the military people all along they were unhappy with uh, uh, Mr. Obama's uh, 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 decision making in that regard but he was up for re-election and uh, uh, so uh, he, he went along with that. So in this sense I think it was quite a professional. I also think it was quite important in the sense that uh, he personally has spoken a number of times uh, against staying in Afghanistan. He has criticized it many times, and I think he confessed uh, on that uh, night uh, saying that, uh, well, I was of a different opinion, but I have been persuaded uh, uh, to announce a policy that is uh, relatively, uh, that is quite different uh, from uh, what it used to be. So I, I, I infer from that that this was more a professional decision making than I would say was a, 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 a political uh, um, decision making. Even though the criticism is that there was not enough details with regards to forces, et cetera, et cetera. I think what's important in policy is the direction of policy. And the direction of policy that he gave uh, was, uh, uh, well, I'm not going to specify a, a deadline. I want to achieve a certain objective, and it would be conditions on the ground that would dictate as to how much uh, would I get involved there. So I think those, uh, those details are unnecessary to be given in advance. I think it is the direction that is important, and sometimes if you give all the details and the direction is not known, it's not going to get you uh, um, anywhere. Well, these are rather the stronger points. Uh, what are the weaker points? Um, I think the weaker point is that uh, uh, um, uh, two, uh, well, more, maybe more, but uh, I'd mentioned two. 
You see, the United States is no longer a sole actor as far as the Afghan conflict is concerned. Uh, even previously, I think there were other actors. Uh, Pakistan was important previously. Uh, but in recent years, other um, actors of much greater importance have become involved in Afghanistan. I think Russia is now involved there. Okay. I think China is involved. I think India was all along involved. I think Iran is much more involved now than it used to be. I think Saudi Arabia is involved. I think Turkey is involved. Okay, well, the Western camp, generally they were involved through NATO, but you know, there are a few actors and uh, uh, in uh, um, President Obama's speech, uh, I think, uh, well, Pakistan was criticized and uh, uh, India was given a, a a new role, well, it's not a new role, but at least its role was mentioned. Uh, India even previously had uh, a pretty good uh, uh, role in uh, economic development uh, uh, in Afghanistan, but uh, uh, maybe a greater emphasis on this. Uh, but uh, uh, there was no, no role mentioned for the other actors uh, uh, in the, the uh, scene, and, uh, I'm not, I, I, and that's a big omission in the sense that it could uh, complicate uh, uh, things. And the the second major omission for me was that, uh, uh, I'll talk later, uh, with the, even with the surge, with, even with increased forces, with even, even with the, the desire on the part of the United States to have a military solution, I don't think there would be a military solution. And I'll come back to this. And unfortunately, in that speech, there was no, no uh, well, there was a mention, but there was not really, the issue was not addressed. How is he going to handle the peace uh, 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 matter? And I think that's a big uh, uh, um, uh, 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 omission there. Uh, well, uh, so I would say it wasn't inconsistent. It was important. It was consistent, but it's not comprehensive as much as it uh, uh, should be. And perhaps it could be built on, uh, on that in the, uh, I mean, later. So what impact will it have on various actors in Afghanistan? This was a positive. This was a real support for the Afghan government, for the current government. And I think uh, Dr. Ghani is quite pleased with what he heard uh, the other night. And I think uh, um, it will help uh, the government uh, fighting forces. It will help the government politically. I would hope that uh, the United States and other uh, uh, allies of Afghanistan or friends of Afghanistan would realize that it's one thing to support the state, but it's another thing to support the government. And I hope that, uh, uh, you know, the government of Afghanistan is not that popular within the country. And I hope that this does not spill over to uh, giving political support to the government to the point that uh, uh, that uh, uh, it will go against the wishes of the, the uh, uh, people. As I said, in terms of balance of uh, forces, I think this will have a positive impact on the government forces and obviously a negative impact on the uh, 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 Taliban. Unfortunately, I think in the short run, there will be intensification of the war, uh, which is uh, uh, not in the best interest of anybody uh, um, involved. And as I said earlier, uh, I don't think uh, there were going to be a decisive victory, uh, military victory. Probably there will be a new stalemate. I think there has been a stalemate since uh, 2011, uh, 2010, 2011, but in the past two years, I think the stalemate, uh, it's a new stalemate uh, that where the Afghan government uh, can, pre to some extent, defend cities, but that almost given up on villages. Uh, uh, okay, it's already, time is over, right? Okay, um, so um, uh, maybe there will be a new stalemate, and uh, uh, eventually there is need for a political, uh, uh, for a political uh, uh, solution. Unfortunately, there is no peace plan by anybody. The government's peace plan is uh, some 12, 13 years old, and it's basically come and join the, the regime and we will uh, forgive you and then you participate. They want more like the Hekmatyar model, and I don't think that is suitable for the uh, 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 Taliban. The Taliban's, uh, their position is not that clear either. Two years ago in the meetings like this uh, uh, we had with the Taliban, they specified three conditions, which was withdrawal of international forces, uh, provisional government, and uh, uh, third was a revision in the Constitution, but unfortunately they have not elaborated on any of those issues, and uh, uh, so that's not uh, 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 really helpful. Um, I think that to have peace in Afghanistan, we do need the support of regional uh, powers. Unfortunately, this current formulation by the U.S. policy sort of uh, uh, de-emphasizes the importance of uh, 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 regional powers. I would just uh, mention a few points since my time is up. I can, cannot elaborate on it. 
I don't think it's, going, it's, it's very helpful that the U.S. is not talking to the Taliban. I think Taliban is a major force, and I think the U.S. should help. I don't think it's very helpful on the part of Taliban that they do not have direct talk with the Afghan government. I think that the Afghan government is uh, the major participant in this conflict and that they uh, uh, should uh, address that issue. I think Pakistan should reconsider its position. Uh, I mean, why would the United States, if you can accuse the Afghan government that they do not have good information, why would the United States uh, blame uh, 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 Pakistan. It's no longer, you know, uh, enemies of uh, Pakistan or opponents of Pakistan that's saying this. It's a major issue that the United States government, with all the information that they have, uh, the, the intelligence information, they come up and they tell you that you are not being helpful. I think it's time for Pakistan to uh, uh, reconsider their, uh, 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 their uh, 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 position here. Um, principles of, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's not not just that the Taliban have not presented a peace plan, or the United States, or the, the Afghan government. Actually, academic, ac academicians, especially institutions such as Pagwash and the uh, relevant institutions, they have not presented any peace plan either. Usually, they have, uh, I know that they are 19 points, but it's not a coherent yet. I mean, there is a few points that okay, it could be used, but uh, I don't think it's, it's a comprehensive peace plan that I would say um, that uh, we can uh, present it. A uh, few principles will have to be uh, uh, observed. One, the principle of sovereignty of the people, uh, I think that has to be, be uh, uh, important. Mm, uh, second, withdrawal of international forces will have to be in line with uh, how much progress we make as far as peace is concerned. I don't think we can have a situation where withdrawal of international forces should be a precondition for uh, uh, peace. It should be part of the peace process, and uh, um, I think it will be okay. Uh, greater attention to Islamic principles, but I hope that the the, the Taliban would specify as to what are those. I think that would be the greatest uh, 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 issue. Well, since I'm uh, out of uh, time, I would simply say that uh, um, the Trump's policy, um, greater focus was on military solution. I think that uh, ultimately we need to focus more on political solution, and I think in this regard, institutions such as Pagwash and intellectuals that can contribute to come up with uh, a plan that would be acceptable to the people of Afghanistan, regional powers, as well as the Taliban and the uh, international community at large. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahadi. Uh, uh, in the lack of any other mediator, in the lack of any other strategy or roadmap for peace, Pagwash initiated its own 19 points peace roadmap and this roadmap has been discussed widely with, uh, with many politicians and figures inside the country and also outside of Afghanistan. It was a very productive approach. Indeed, there should be a very comprehensive roadmap in future to, to be developed by Pagwash or other mediation uh, institutions. Uh, Dr. Seb Muradian, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, as, as uh, you can see the program, I'm not supposed to be on this panel, but m since Mr. Zarif couldn't make it, uh, uh, or Mr. Kuchi, I don't know if I've been chosen to represent Ambassador Kuchi or Mr. Zarif uh, to substitute. Anyway, I'm very grateful to Pagwash for giving me the opportunity to attend this important uh, 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 conference, and particularly that's, that you have invited the large Afghan delegation uh, to this conference. If I can share one observation is that there is no woman in our delegations and all are uh, men here. Since now uh, uh, many associate Afghanistan, uh, Afghans would kind of be patriarchal call Mrs. Junius, I think uh, it would be good if we also include women in the next uh, 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 Afghan delegations from Afghanistan not on this, on this panel. Uh, just give you one example about the, uh, uh, the relationship between our country and the, the woman to correct about perception of Afghanistan as a miscegeneous uh, cultures. And that is about the Persian language, which is the language of our country. It is one of the few languages which is a neutral when it comes to gender uh, uh, identification. All lang most important languages such as uh, English, German, or major language, they have gender uh, designation, whereas uh, Persian is one of the few old languages that does not have a, 
a gender uh, grammar, which is that it is a neutral when it comes to gender. Really, this misgenuous characterization of our culture uh, does not represent the totality of our cultures, uh, and there are a lot of elements in our culture that we celebrate females' uh, contribution as citizen. Uh, since I was given a kind of a last minute notice to prepare for this panel because I am uh, to speak tomorrow uh, on the Central Asia. So my speech was mainly for Central Asian dimension of the Afghan conflict. However, since I have been asked to be on this panel, uh, I thought that I would choose a topic that is as relevant to the Pakwash, which is about the Taliban. We all know that Afghanistan and the Afghan conflict is a multifaceted conflict that involve uh, different actors, different uh, drivers uh, here, and it's up to the individual which aspect of that conflict wants to, to focus and, and to, to speak here. There are important uh, dimension of the conflict. One can speak of the, the, the ethnic dimension of the Afghan conflict, which is a, a, an important issue that we have to take into account. The regional dimension of the Afghan conflict, particularly the Afghanistan-Pakistan dimension of that conflict, and also the Taliban dimension of that, that, that conflict. Since, uh, 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 as I said, that I would like to speak on the, the Taliban dimension of the Afghan conflict, I would leave aside the other dimension for another occasion. So the Taliban dimension of the conflict, I would start with this uh, observation, is that there is no unified view about the Taliban. And uh, if you speak with a major stakeholder in Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan, they have a different interpretation, different understanding of the Taliban. And I have not come across uh, three identical definitions of the Taliban. That is started among our Afghans, that if five Afghans sit together, you will, uh, less, you will have three different definitions of, of the Taliban. And then at the regional level is the same that, that they have a different view about the Taliban in Europe is the same. To Washington, when I go to Washington, the definition that the State Department gives about the Taliban fundamentally different from the definition that I had from the, uh, the CIA or White House or the uh, Department of Defense. So that's one challenge that we have uh, in Afghanistan is that there is no unified view about the, the Taliban and everyone else has his or her own definition of the Taliban. So what is my definition of the Taliban? Again, this is not an, a, a final one, but uh, one of the uh, uh, definition. And in order to understand the, the Taliban, I identify five pillars that sub, uh, uh, constitute the Taliban. And those five pillars really are the pillars that sustain the Taliban as a group, as a movement, as, as a political actors. The first and most important pillars of the Taliban is the ideological uh, nature of the Taliban. The Taliban essentially are ideological movement, and that they have an ideology which is part of the pan-Islamist movement here. And then they have uh, access to ideological infrastructure, and the ideological infrastructure of the Taliban are madrasa uh, in Pakistan, mosques in Afghanistan, and Islamist party in, 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 uh, in Pakistan. The second pillar that sustain the Taliban are the external actors, and that external actors primarily is Pakistan's base, but now uh, we have uh, evidence that Iran support the Taliban, Russia support the Taliban, and even some Central Asian state, they have some political connection uh, with the Taliban, yes. So the external support that Taliban receive is the second pillar that sustain the Taliban. The third uh, pillar that sustain the Taliban is the conducive environment that Taliban operates. And that conducive environment is uh, 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 the, the presence of foreign troops in Afghanistan, bad governance of the my government's uh, illiteracy uh, poverty. So there is a conducive environment in Afghanistan that provides an en enabling environment for the sustainment of the Taliban. The fourth is pillar of the Taliban is the organizational structure of the Taliban. Organizational structure of the Taliban in terms of the business model is very efficient. 
to the type of uh, uh, business that they are operating. It is very efficient, it's very dynamic, and it's a kind of a network organization. It's not typical uh, hierarchical organization one can imagine. So it's very in terms of the effectiveness and efficiency of the Taliban organizational uh, uh, model, uh, it is a very uh, efficient model. And the fifth pillars that sustain the Taliban is the uh, uh, financial aspect. To be a, a Taliban commander is very lucrative business. You have access to millions of dollars. Yes. We are not talking about $10 a day Taliban. We are talking about millions dollar command, million dollars commanders who have <laughs> access to drug money, to organize uh, 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 um, uh, crime money, and to the money that they receive from different uh, intelligence organizations. Therefore, there are these five pillars that sustain the Taliban. Now, the question about the, a conflict resolution or peace plan for the Taliban has to address this pillar of the Taliban. We cannot have only a plan that only address a pillar or two pillars. Therefore, it, in order to have a, a comprehensive uh, a, a peace agreement, uh, uh, we have to have a, a, a plan that address five pillars that sustain the Taliban. What are the demands of the Taliban? Again, uh, I do not have time to go to details, but I can categorize the demand of the Taliban into three categories. One is the Taliban's legitimate demands, like the way that uh, about the prisoners, that uh, I think they, we, the Afghan governments and the international troops, they have to recognize that there is a legitimacy in Taliban's uh, about the, uh, 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 the way that we treat the, the, the prisoners here. Yes. The second category of Taliban's demand is a kind of paranoia, that uh, they think that the, the international community has come to Afghanistan in order to uh, uproot Islamic character of Afghan state and Afghan society. So there's a lot of paranoia, disinformation, particularly about rank and file the Taliban, about the, the nature of the emerging state of Afghanistan here. The th third uh, demand of the Taliban, which are the main, it is a, 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 a hegemonic uh, a, a demand uh, of their the demands. And I'll come back to what that, that means here, is that they see themselves as the sole representative of Afghan uh, nationalism, they, uh, rep they see themselves as the sole representative of Islamic values. And uh, they don't recognize uh, non-Taliban as sufficiently Afghan or sufficiently Muslim. The Talib means the absolute Afghan and absolute uh, Muslimness here. So just therefore that they, this back to their ideological natures, which, which every ideological movement uh, they have some abstract idea. So this is the third category of the Taliban is this uh, the hegemonic uh, demand. Now, what are the three uh, settlement, political settlement that we are talking about Afghanistan? The first uh, political settlement or vision that uh, exists is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. What does that mean in relation to the Taliban? Islamic Republic of Afghanistan means that Islamic Republic of Afghanistan recognizes Taliban as a citizen of the country. Islamic Republic of Afghanistan recognizes Taliban as a political actors. And Islamic Republic of Afghanistan allows Taliban to operate as any other Afghan citizen and as any uh, uh, Afghan political actors. But not with a geography. The Islamic Republic of Afghanistan does not want to give a geography to the Taliban. And the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan does not allow Taliban to have both weapons and politics. They have to choose either politics or violence. And the model of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is like Jamiat Islami, like Hizb Islami, like other political parties. <coughs> the second vision is Pakistani vision, and that is the model of Hezbollah. It is, uh, uh, that is my interpretation of a Pakistani vision. The Pakistani establishing vision is a kind of Hezbollah of Lebanon. Hezbollah of Lebanon has three elements. One is it has geography in South Lebanon, it has a political powers in Lebanese politics, and also maintain Hezbollah's uh, militia 
identity. And that is the vision, the model that the Pakistan establishment has been promoting uh, a Taliban as a kind of uh, Taliban. The third vision is the Taliban Emirat Islami Taliban. Emirat Islami Taliban, and that is the vision that the hegemonic ab uh, absolute uh, uh, vision. Now, the way forward, I think the way forward since we do not have to, I think a good example is the model of Tajikistan. I think Tajikistan uh, civil war shows that the role of the neighboring countries that Russia, Iran, and Afghanistan play to facilitate an agreement. And now that is the request that we have from the neighbor Pakistan and Iran to play that facilitator actors in bringing together uh, an inclusive uh, a political settlement, not an absolute one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Semuradion. Uh, now we are moving to Dr. Sefaru Kazam. Just uh, we have to respect the time. We have very short time. We have 20 minutes and we have three speakers. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm so thankful to Pagwash for such a beautiful conference. And uh, so I'm quite happy to be among such a good audience. Uh, I will follow the remarks of uh, Dr. Ahadi, was just a little bit brush. Uh, the Trump uh, announcement is a matter of interest to the Afghans. Interest, the matter of interest to the American taxpayers and to the NATO member states. So this is why this is the Trump announcement, long awaiting, was important and is important. Trump had some points, but uh, what we expected him, what the Americans expected him, his speech was mainly for military, for home consumption, for to please the military that was humiliated by him during his presidential election. Exactly the same thing happened with Obama. Obama when came to, uh, went to the White House in January 2009, he was the, faced with the same question. What sh must be done with the, the Afghan war 10 years in Afghanistan? He asked first the military. Obvious, military was in Afghanistan, active. And the military is looking to the military side of the, of the conflict usually. They are not uh, concerned about m other issues. So the military said more, more uh, uh, troops. In Vietnam War, the military was insisting for more till the collapse of Saigon. The Russian generals in Afghanistan were asking for more troops till the collapse. The American military certainly are asking for more till we see what will happen. So the military asked for more, and Obama said, how many? They said 40,000, 30,000, and total of 150,000 NATO troops. And Obama said, OK, take. But would you, would you complete, complete the job? They said, yes. He was a wise man. He said, if you do not complete the job, then I will act. And after two years, we understood that with 120,000 world-class military, nothing happened. And the positive, Obama said he will withdraw. But Obama had uh, also had a vacancy or had a kind of, he did, he announced the withdrawal without coupling with a political solution. Withdrawing means leaving mess like the Russians did, the Soviet Union. So when, when the, at the end of the Obama tenure, he faced with this dilemma. He said he will pull out, but there was no future political solution. So he, he didn't have time 
to come back and offer political solution. He left the matter to his successor, to Trump. We were waiting for Trump for over half a year to announce what to announce. The announcement was, yes, he said that um, he will send more troops, but he will not say how many. Yes, he, will, uh, he said that the time will, the end will not be disclosed. But he was expecting by the Afghans and the American taxpayers that when, when this war will end, this, the most, the, the, the longest American war, when that will end, he didn't give this answer. He said victory and victory and we will win. How will you will win? Well, where is the strategy? Then he, he said that Taliban, he gave a, 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 a kind of gesture about the political solution. He will invite the Taliban after they are dwarfed, after they are weakened, after exactly the same thing that the generals told to Obama, that let us have military power and squeeze the Taliban, diminish them, dwarf them, and tell them, come to the table of, of negotiation uh, with, with the terms the Americans or the Kabul government provide. Exactly the same, the journalists now told to Trump that we will, in Trump announce, that first our duty is to weaken the Taliban and, tell, and then, then tell them, come to the negotiation. But the danger is, the, 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 uh, Trump recognized the Taliban as a power and the future part of the government. This is a blow to the Kabul government. If tomorrow, certainly the Taliban are part of the government at least, then why they should fight now? Why they should fight now? That is a clue for political solution, but without comprehensive offering a comprehensive uh, strategy for that. No framework. And that framework the Trump gave, that was a failure framework, Obama time. Squeeze, weaken the Taliban and come, I call them come. It didn't work. And another thing that Obama, I mean, the Trump said that no reconstruction or no uh, nation building or no whatever term he called, and we are for killing in Afghanistan. What does it mean? If you bombard a village, destroy the village, who will build? Who will rebuild? You have to, because you are the power there. Not it is, it is not a military question, it is a social, it is a, uh, uh, after all, human beings are involved. If, if you have hundreds of thousands, I mean 150,000 before war and now there are, if they are active 24 hours in Afghanistan destroying, well, well the, the nation will expect uh, reconstruction as well. And uh, also he said that uh, the Afghan government must share economic burden. It is a vague, we do not know how Afghan government can share economic burden with the United States. Yes, one good interpretation is that if there is less corruption, probably Americans, little, little money will, will work. But uh, corruption is so deep in Afghanistan that uh, uh, I don't see that the, the, that will be curbed unless we have a political solution. The other interpretation should be that, okay, the, the Americans may give Afghanistan military operation to private security companies to bring out the mines and to give uh, uh, kind of, recontract or subcontract the Afghan militias, the Afghan warlords to bring mines out 
the mines and the mines will go and the uh, the, comp the economic burden will be relieved. I mean, there are different interpretations what, well, how, how the Afghan government can, can share the, the cost of the war. And uh, finally, Trump was emphasizing much upon the victory, upon uh, he was, I, I found kind of slogans rather the, to be a comprehensive uh, 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 strategy that we were waiting for long. Yes, we will like to support the Afghan government, they must do, uh, but, but he has to find the way out as well. The political solution is a fair must. This way that for the last 16 years gone, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. And there is no future for the American policy going on. And there must something should be done. There must be something to be done, and that is only and only that we have to, uh, to tell to Trump and the others that no military victory in Afghanistan, no military solution to the Afghan problem. And the only solution is to find a political solution, and the political solution is that the, to give opportunity to either to talk to the Taliban or give opportunity if they cannot. The Taliban do not talk to the Afghan government because they do not recognize as the government. And the government is talking to the Taliban, but the government condition is to, uh, to, to preserve the legitimacy of the Afghan government, which the Taliban are not. So this, the one thing is that if they do not create conditions, direct negotiation between Af the Afghan government and the Taliban, they have to give opportunity to, uh, to the Afghans to mediate, to uh, international organizations like Fagwash and others to mediate, to, uh, to ask the United Nations to mediate. At least they must find a solution to the Afghan problem, and that is the way that uh, the, the, the conflict can be solved, and no military solution for the Afghan problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saif Farooq. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Ruslan Shah Saib. <coughs> Bismillah ar rahim Let me start by thanking Pagwash and uh, the Qazakh government for helping to organize such an important uh, event. Uh, in my view, the little time that we have, I think we should spend this time in trying to promote uh, reconciliation and trying to lay down an approach that takes us nearer to a solution rather than hurling accusations, uh, making claims, etc., etc. That would, I think, defeat the very purpose of uh, such meetings, particularly in the context of the spirit of Pagwash. Uh, the war has lasted uh, more than 16 years and it has consumed a trillion dollars of American taxpayer, taxpayers' money. And that's a colossal amount. Little less than 200,000 people have perished inside Afghanistan in thousands of the coalition forces and Afghan National Army uh, have suffered. Uh, there is a, a, an acute despondency within Afghanistan. Uh, things are getting worse by the day. So I think in such a perspective, in such a situation, let us try to figure out how can we break this impasse that we are confronting today in Afghanistan? I'll lay down a few points before you for your consideration. The first is an acknowledgement of the fact that the policy and approach pursued for 16 years has not delivered. It hasn't worked. 
Second is that there has to be an agonizing reappraisal, and that reappraisal must incorporate the objective realities. Third is the new vision must be premised on the emergence of a sovereign, united, peaceful, stable Afghanistan. And fourth, the policy or its objective must include a reaffirmation that the country needs to focus on building up democratic institutions that derive strength from Afghanistan's constitution. And five, the regional countries to guarantee complete non-interference in the affairs of Afghanistan, but nonetheless they must continue to support the country in the gigantic task of reconstruction and rehabilitation. What are the stumbling blocks to peace in Afghanistan? I think this is an important issue, and I would spend one or two minutes on this. The stumbling blocks to peace in Afghanistan are, and we must identify these in order to move forward to make progress, is the pro-status quo lobby within Afghanistan, because they're the product of the status quo and the beneficiaries of the status quo. So they would not like to seek reconciliation at their own expense. Uh, secondly, there is no clear vision formulated by the United States in ending its longest war in history. Uh, let me react to an earlier statement by saying that the Trump's vision doesn't offer anything new. Uh, it's old wine in new bottle. The simple fact is that if 145,000 troops could not deliver peace, how could 4,000 more troops deliver, would deliver peace? Thirdly, uh, there is a failure to identify the root cause of the insurgency. This is important because unless we identify the root cause of the insurgency, we are not going to find a solution. Fourth is the failure inability of the Taliban to convert themselves into a political movement which has a manifesto, which has a hierarchy, which can be talked to, and people should know where they stand on critical issues. Uh, to an extent, Pakistan also is responsible for lack of understanding on how to, on how to evolve a strategy that would, on the one hand, bring us nearer to peace and reconciliation, and on the other hand, would be reflective of the aspirations of the people. It's not for Pakistani government to do that, but as an important stakeholder, Pakistan should have clarified its own position. Uh, now, how to proceed <coughs> Based on these considerations, how to proceed further? The goal is, the goal must be defined as well. The goal is a multi-ethnic, broad-based government that includes the resistance. The strategy is the, govern, the convening of a grand assembly in the typical of one tradition. Uh, one might argue that there is a parliament, and the parliament is a grand assembly, but not. No, because the parliament doesn't in include the resistance. So a grand national assembly or a grand loe jirga, which is an assembly, would include the resistance. In, in the resistance, I am not including the IS, which is... Uh, uh, detestable, despicable uh, entity in which must be uh, eliminated by using force uh, relentlessly until they are 
they're uh, removed from the scene. In uh, dealing with Taliban, let me give you the American perspective. Richard Olson was America's ambassador to Pakistan from 2012 to 2015. Then he was serving as uh, America's uh, special envoy for Afghanistan and Pakistan. In an article last year, he says, and I quote, uh, the United States troops have been in Afghanistan since October 2001, and this deployment is estimated to have cost the taxpayers at least $783 billion. That was one year ago. But this only talks about the military expenditure, not the economic assistance. Then he goes on to say that it has always been clear to senior military officers like General Patrius who was the American commander in Afghanistan, as well as to diplomats like me, that the war could only end through a political settlement, a process through which the Afghan government and the Taliban would reconcile their differences in an agreement also acceptable to the international community. Uh, he goes on to say, despite more than 15 years of war, the United States, and this is important, the United States has never had a fundamental quarrel with the Taliban per se. The United States never had a fundamental quarrel with the Taliban per se. Now be that as it may, I think this to an extent clarifies the American perspective and American position. And the, and the, other hand, it is a food for thought also that two years ago, when the Americans publicly stated that they do not regard the Taliban as terrorists, they are insurgents. In the wake of that statement came this article from uh, the former ambassador, uh, Sir uh, Ms. Ambassador Richard, uh, Richard Olson who was also a special envoy. Now, with this in view, let us embark upon a strategy of what to do, given the, the many constraints. I talked about uh, uh, a, grand, a grand assembly, uh, and the grand assembly would be mandated to create an environment for a transitional government after a necessary amendment in the Afghan constitution. And that transitional government would then take steps to hold elections within a stipulated period of time. A UN mandated council of countries such as China, Iran, India, I'm including India, although I'm returning to Pakistan in two days, uh, the three Central Asian countries, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and Pakistan. This council, UN-mandated council of countries, would underwrite the agreements reached in the Loe Jirga. China's role, of course, is very important as a mediator because of China's uh, huge investment not only financial and inve economic investment, but also China's role, as I would explain a little while later, in the One Belt, One Road initiative. And without Afghanistan being in complete peace, that initiative will not be realized. Uh, well, there could be, a, there could be a, a question that in the presence of a parliament and a constitution, what is the need? for a grand national assembly or a grand tribal assembly. Because we have had a constitution, we have had a parliament, but these institutions have not delivered. 
the insurgency has spread. It is uh, alleged that the insurgency have sanctuaries in other countries, namely Pakistan. I pose one fundamental question. Anyone in this hall should tell me that in the last 16 years, can there be any example of people crossing over from Pakistan into Afghanistan having been confronted, captured, killed, shown on the TV? This is a long border. The Americans have all the equipment. They have uh, drones. They have radars. They have electronic equipment. The Afghanist Afghanistan army is, is, is police and army are about 300,000 strong. But are there any examples? Number one. Number two, if it is assumed that some people are crossing over because it's a porous border, now who would explain the insurgency in Herat? Who would explain the insurgency in Ghor? Who would explain the insurgency in Sarepol, in Qunduz, in Faryab, in Farah, which have no border with Pakistan? They are hundreds of miles away from Pakistan. Who would explain the insurgency in the 24 provinces out of 34 in Afghanistan? Pakistan has a border only with seven or eight provinces. And there is a heavy deployment on both sides. So I think let us not deceive ourselves. Let us acknowledge the realities. Let us acknowledge the realities. Let us also acknowledge what is at stake. What is at stake? At stake is the at stake is so much. The at stake is the plight in predicament of 30 million impoverished Afghans. Number one, it, because the, the unemployment rate has gone up to 40 percent. In 2015 alone, more than 250,000 Afghans left the country in pursuit of a, a better life in Middle East and Europe. Uh, um, the opium production has gone up to 5,000 tons. It is now cultivated on more than 250,000 hectares under the American watch and the Afghan army's watch. Uh, at stake is the stability of the whole region. At stake is the One Belt, One Road initiative, which promises to bring billions of dollars into this area. At stake is Tapi, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, India Pakistan pipeline project. Its stake is Casa 1000. Let's end it. Uh, uh, we have a short uh, time. Maybe we'll discuss in the working group. When, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. When so, when so much is at stake uh, and so little is being done, and there is such a tremendous amount of confusion on how to proceed further, I think let us, let us take some initiative. Let us take, embark on a new initiative because all the old initiatives have failed to deliver. All the old initiatives, despite that, the insurgency has grown and is growing by the day. I wanted to say a few more things, but because of the time constraint, um, I would uh, stop here. And I think this is enough food for thought for many of you uh, who would help us in the question and answer session or in the, in the, in the working group. Uh, to try to find a solution that is acceptable to the Americans, to the Afghan government, and to the Taliban um, at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ruslan Shasak. So, okay. Madam Rafael. Okay, I will try to be quick. Uh, thanks to Pugwash and the Kazakh government, and thanks particularly to uh, Pugwash for its continuing initiative on Afghanistan. Uh, to keep attention focused on the political side. I think that's very important. Um, a lot of been, has already been said about the new uh, U.S. policy and strategy towards Afghanistan. I think one shouldn't underestimate uh, the importance of the ending of the uncertainty that went on for months about what the U.S. was going to be doing in Afghanistan. And uh, suffice it to say that the possibilities or the options of a total withdrawal 
uh, or turning the whole thing over to a mercenary force, uh, which many did not think was a good idea, myself included, were seriously on the table. So it was really important that we finally decided that even though uh, the policy doesn't look very new, it was better than the alternatives that were, were on the table. Um, much has been said about the lack of clarity, um, particularly on the political side, so I wanted to talk just a moment um, about what those who participated on the political side of this very long and intensive and thorough review have been able to say uh, on the political side. And essentially, uh, the approach is to reinvigorate the political architecture. This is the term that's being used, both inside Afghanistan and regionally. Uh, there's talk about the Kabul Compact uh, with President Ghani, which uh, has, has um, elements of governance, economic development, security, and the peace process. And there are benchmarks that are supposed to be regularly reviewed. Um, and all of this is, is supposed to underscore the fact that Afghans are responsible for progress in the government and society. So that's one. Uh, one aspect of it. Uh, the second is the need to improve relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Nothing explicit about how that would be done, but it's recognized that that needs to be done. Uh, third, uh, harnessing the influence of China uh, and the need to revive the quadrilateral talks between Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, and the U.S. Um, there's talk of reviving the regional, the neighbors uh, plus the U.S., the so-called six plus one talks, recognizing that uh, a solution in Afghanistan needs to be supported by the neighbors, and of course there needs to be arrangements for non-interference uh, from the neighbors. Uh, there's also a recognition of the need to improve uh, relations between India and Pakistan, which I think was important, especially given the fact that in the President's speech, he talked about the growing strategic relationship between the United States and called explicitly upon India to do more in Afghanistan. Um, so I think that's significant. The overall goal, uh, the people participating in this say, is to shape the situation so that a political settlement is possible. And of course, to make the Taliban realize that uh, they can't win um, and that to put some political pressure on them to make negotiations possible. So that's, that's sort of um, what one hears uh, currently from the political side. Now, the challenges to this policy, and I recognize there's been much commentary and uh, people recognize that it's not really new. As I say, my own view, it's better than the alternatives that were on the table. But the problems are just when everyone seems to agree, almost everyone, that there's no military solution, uh, the American approach as outlined by President Obama is very military centric. And I think that's not just because there were so many generals involved in formulating the policy, uh, but because, in fact, the military track is easier, uh, certainly easier to understand. Um, and even if it doesn't work, it's easier to implement. On the political side, as has been so well reflected by the comments of panelists here, uh, it's very fraught with complexities uh, that outsiders really struggle to navigate. Um, and for the U.S. at this present point, uh, there's the added complication that we don't have uh, staff designated on the political side to take up this problem. Um, as many of you know, the office that had been dealing with Afghanistan and Pakistan in the State Department has been dissolved. Those responsibilities are shifting over to the South and Central Asia Bureau, but there's no set team in place. Um, so that is a problem. Uh, and within this policy as outlined by President Trump, there are a number of contradictions, and some of which have been mentioned here by the panel. Um, saying that we have no timelines is designed to um, tell the Taliban that they can't wait us out. But if you have no timelines, 
then it takes away the incentive for reform on the part of the Afghan government. Uh, and in fact, the president also said, we have no timelines, but our patience is not infinite. Um, and it's also the case that we will continue, which I think is a good thing, with our economic and military support to the government. Uh, so there's, there's a contradiction there uh, which ultimately needs to be resolved. Um, there's uh, <laughs> a similar contradiction in saying no nation building. Um, and of course, it's nation building and institution building, as various panelists have said, that are uh, an essential element to preparing the way for an eventual peace and for improving the, the standing and legitimacy of the Afghan government among the Afghan people. So I think even though why we, while the president said there'd be no nation building, it really does need to continue. And I'm, I'm confident uh, that it will continue. And then finally, there is the um, uh, indication that we've lost patience with Pakistan yet again, um, and that they must uh, do a number of things that we require, um, particularly stopping support for, for the Afghan Taliban inside Pakistan and so on. Um, and the problem, the contradiction there is, of course, for Pakistan, and Pakistani colleagues uh, can be much more detailed and articulate on this, uh, they have legitimate security concerns in Afghanistan and with India, and uh, U.S. assertions to the contrary, I think this needs to be uh, dealt with head on, and Pakistan security uh, concerns need to be addressed directly. And of course, there's the other contradiction, which is we really do need Pakistan to supply our troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, historically, when things have become very tense, Pakistan has demonstrated that it can, can stop those supply lines, and that's very costly and disruptive for the United States. So those are some contradictions which need to be resolved in our policy moving forward. So what, and then finally, in terms of the challenges in this uh, uh, policy or the problems with this policy, is that we, we make assumptions about the Taliban that we haven't really tested. The Taliban doesn't want to negotiate. If the Taliban were in power somehow in Afghanistan, it would mean a return of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. The Taliban are, are lumped in uh, with terrorist groups who are a threat to the U.S. homeland, uh, and we haven't really challenged those assumptions. So those are some of the problems with the policy that need to be further worked on, in my view. Um, so what does the United States need to do, in my view? First of all, they need to get a strong uh, diplomatic team in place, and that can be done. It just hasn't been. Um, secondly, we need to prioritize the political track and expand it. Uh, many commentaries have, uh, commentators have noted that Russia, Iran weren't included in the president's speech at all. Clearly, they're players. Um, and part of the political track for the United States is to quietly explore with the Taliban what their positions really are. Um, and in that regard, perhaps help to shape um, some of their sense of what is possible and what isn't possible. Um, and this can't be done with a few one-off meetings. We've had one-off meetings with the Taliban. Uh, some of my colleagues here know more about those than I do. There has to be a process and it has to be consistent and continual. And I would add that the U.S. trying to understand where the Taliban is coming from on the political side is not inconsistent with an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led uh, process here. Ultimately, obviously, the political discussions are, are going to be done by the Afghans. But as a party to this whole situation, which the United States is by virtue of the fact that we have so many troops there, it behooves us to understand uh, on our own what's really going on. So bottom line is that uh, even though the purpose of our new, new strategy was to prove the Taliban is wrong when they say 
uh, that we have the watches and they have the time. In fact, uh, that's not really clear yet. Um, I think time isn't on our side, um, and the more time that goes by without prioritizing the political track, the, uh, the more opportunity there are for more disruptive elements uh, to become involved. So I think that's what the United States need to do. I know that, that many people who are close to this region and close to the Afghan conflict um, you know, think that Americans sometimes are rather naive, um, but the fact is, we are where we are, and I believe very strongly that the United States, given its involvement, has a responsibility to work to find a way forward that finally brings a peaceful future for the Afghan people. Uh, we really do owe them that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Rafael. made a delegation of six people coming here. They were prevented by the fact that they did not get the authorization from the Kazakh government. So we have to, we have to understand that the Taliban were ready to come here and present their viewpoint. The missing chair is a chair of the Taliban. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, so, we got diverse uh, ideas uh, from our distinguished panelists, from the definition of Taliban to uh, uh, lacking uh, peace, uh, peace uh, uh, perspective in the new strategy of the uh, U.S., uh, some criticism, some very uh, interesting proposals by our colleague, and also uh, analysis by Madame Rafael. Now the floor is open. Uh, colleagues can ask the questions. Yes, first. Hakim Saib, Omar Turt. Okay, let's get these three questions and then, yeah, microphone. Thank you. Rakesh Sood from India. I had the privilege of serving in Kabul for three years with the uh, party with Ambassador Mohman. You know, we have seen different insurgencies in different parts of the world in different continents. In India, we have seen insurgencies and we have seen peace accords having been negotiated over periods of time. And if we look at that, and many of these have been compiled into uh, models as it were. If we look into it, we find that there are two, three things that are common and many of our uh, panelists focused on it. The first is that between the government and the insurgency, there has to be a mutual recognition. They, they have to recognize each other as legitimate interlocutors. And it was quite clear that I think that the Taliban does not recognize the government as a legitimate interlocutor, at least at this stage. Secondly, there normally has to be, I don't say a military victory by one side or the other, but at least some kind of a stalemate so that both sides decide that a military solution is no longer possible. So there is some kind of, uh, if not a ceasefire, at least a cessation of violence. We don't see that yet. We see ongoing violence in a sense that, you know, Kunduz falls, then government counterattack, government forces counterattack, and so on. So we see continuing violence in that sense. We also see normally that within this framework, uh, there is some kind of a framework within which that process of discussion then takes place in the framework of, as Ambassador Moman said, perhaps a grand assembly, perhaps a constitution, perhaps a whatever. But here we have no agreement on any kind of a framework. And then comes the second major negotiation, because normally this is always a two-stage negotiation. This is the first stage, which is talks about talks. And then comes the second stage, which is actually about power sharing. And in this first stage, you provide the assurance of security because you don't want, you can't deal, you can't have talks while the fellows are carrying guns. So people put down weapons. There is a kind of a security assurance that, all right, as long as the talks are there, we are not attacking each other. Now, given the fact that the stage one from this, from what has been said, does not seem to exist, it is very difficult to actually visualize 
uh, how we can start this ball rolling because we have not yet reached the three preconditions which are the characteristics of every single peace dialogue, every single successful peace dialogue with any insurgency movement in any part of the world. Thank you, Mr. Saad. We will get all questions and then our colleagues will be answered. Okay. Mr. Fahim was the second, sorry. Indeed, thank you very much for the comprehensive uh, presentations and information you shared. Just I have a question and uh, comment to Mr. Rustam Shomoman. Uh, no doubt, huge amount of financial and military aid provided to Afghanistan since 2001. And precise figures you shared was really uh, convincing us that the achievement was not in balance with that. Is there an idea how much development and military aid provided to Pakistan since 2001? This question. In comment regarding no capture in the border, I think everyone who are dealing with South Asia politics and developments knows that there are no big fish to ca be captured. As for sure, everyone recalls. Osama bin Laden was killed in Mozambique. Um, um, Mullah Omar was, uh, died, passed away in South Africa. And Mullah Akhtar Mansour was also killed and Kenya. So this is very clear. Thank you. Mr. Omar. Well, uh, dear friends uh, and colleagues, uh, I think uh, when discussing the war in Afghanistan, uh, it's not an easy uh, topic to discuss. It's a very long uh, lasting war in Afghanistan. Me being as a uh, governor of a province where my office was three kilometer away from the uh, uh, front line of the war between Taliban and Afghan uh, military forces and uh, during my 11 month work I noticed a lot of uh, dirty games and dirty issues. It's not an easy thing that we are discussing here. Uh, I think what uh, Pagwash need to do uh, is to uh, create, to work on creation of a strong uh, political will behind, uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, you know, fight against this uh, war and to fight for the peace in Afghanistan. Uh, if there is a political will, then everybody can find easily that this is a war of logistic. You know? If we are uh, you know, ca controlling 60% of the land and we, our cost is 5.5 billion, what will be the cost of the opposition uh, who control 40% of the land? So, that's true that they have, they might have also uh, billions dollar of cost, you know, from where this come and how they are feed it. This is a question, if we find this question, everything will be clear. Thanks. Thank you. We will take one question from Drani Saib and then to you. Yeah. Drani Saib was waiting long time. Thank you very much, Chair. I must say that this is one of the more balanced and sensible discussion that one has heard of Afghanistan. The problem with me is that since uh, it has been so lack of provocation, I cannot come up with a hard-hitting retort from the Pakistani side. I still will make one suggestion. If the war has gone on for such a long time, and if peace has not made any headway, despite all our efforts and our appeals, especially to the United States, please do reconcile with the fact that talking is not the business of the United States. It doesn't do, ever. I think Ambassador Raffel has made a mention, Paolo initially also gave a reference, where has it actually started talking and not and stop bombing in fact bombing is the business it's a very lucrative business not only because uh, people like industrial um, military industrial uh, complex the benefit but also politically Cheney did mention it that the conflict helps you can play one side or the other and who can play it better than the United States 
And in this particular case, Ambassador Rustam Shah very, very, I think, diplomatically set a forces of status quo. The fact is, some people in the Kabul regime do benefit. They applauded uh, the emergence of Daesh in 2014 because that meant that the Americans would not leave and they can continue to rule the roost. And again, some voices were happy, despite the fact whatever, um, Minister, you have said about uh, Trump's speech, that thank God that limit has been removed and the American forces can stay on. And so the status quo continues, except the problem is that if it does, some people traditionally will continue to resist. That is in the history, that's in the DNA of the tribesmen of some people there. And in that case, if you really want to do it, my recipe is known to you, within Afghanistan you can do it. You don't have to wait for Pakistan or for that matter for the United States or anyone else. The closest that it came to when Karzai made, you know, a, a laid a precondition on signing the BSA, start the dialogue with the Taliban. That's what his appeal was. It was not going to happen. But outside, and that is the only good news that I can give the audience here, Pakistan, because it gets so affected, started mending its fences with the regional powers, with Iran, reached out to Russia. You can consider the history. It was a good step. Russia responded positively. China was always on board. Even on India, it went, started going to the Istanbul dialogue or Istanbul process because Pakistan removed its veto, 2000, 2011. It did happen. It is positioning itself for that particular purpose. And, and if that brings, you know, this concern to us that the Iranians and the Russians are reaching out to the Taliban, it is for that purpose. How do we now, all of us, push from outside? But essentially, if you like to believe, whatever one has known of the Afghans and the tribesmen, you can do it within. Uh, I do not know how many people were present there um, in a very big gathering, BBC organized it in Kabul, and on the uh, panel, four of us, Melala Shanwari, um, Zahil Wal, the present ambassador there, Zama Sud and I were sitting, and the two sensible remarks were made both by the women participants. Melala Shanwari talked about the pugwash process in uh, Doha, as to how well prepared the Taliban were and how ill prepared the Kabul regime was. And a lady from the soul said, why are we waiting for the others to come and tell us or facilitate the talk? We can do it ourselves. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Drani. Uh, we have got uh, two questions and also a few remarks. I think uh, let's go ahead with uh, our fellows to answer the questions and then maybe we go to the second round for one or two questions. No? Okay. Time is unfortunate. Oh, we have, we have working group also. Okay. For these two questions, uh, Ahadi Seb, maybe you, Dr. Seb, you. Um, I, I don't know what the questions were, but I would just comment on Ambassador uh, Sud's uh, comment. Uh, I think that the preconditions. Uh, uh, I think we have been in a stalemate for some time. Okay, I think recently, the past two years, I think the Taliban have improved their position. But I don't think the Taliban um, ever had the, the, uh, the capability really to overthrow the regime. Uh, and I think now probably uh, with the new American assistance, uh, probably the government will get uh, a little bit of the upper hand in this regard. But I think eventually there will be a new stalemate. I think the stalemate is there. I think it was the question of expectation. I think the Taliban, they expected that the government will become gradually weaker and weaker and perhaps uh, they could uh, uh, achieve a lot more. And I think everyone should realize, the government, the United States, regional powers, Taliban, they all should realize that uh, uh, hopefully there will not be really an you know, overthrow of the government or uh, that uh, 
and, and that the government should realize that uh, Taliban is a force there. Uh, if they don't accommodate the Taliban, if they don't opt for a political solution, then the, the conflict will go on. Okay? So I think you know, that in a way that there, that there is that uh, 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 stalemate. And that's what I'm calling for the Taliban to uh, recognize uh, the government. It is kind of strange. Usually it's the government that does not recognize in other instances. It's the government that does not recognize the insurgency. In this situation, it's the insurgency that, that does not want to uh, 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 recognize the government. Uh, but I think the U.S. is a major player, okay? And uh, I don't think it makes much sense uh, to seek political settlement and that the U.S. does not, one way, directly or indirectly, talk to the Taliban as to uh, what they uh, want. So, you know, that would be uh, my comment. I, I think I would also comment on Ambassador Moman's uh, um, recommendation. I think it would be, 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 be very much acceptable to the Afghan to have uh, a multi-ethnic, broad-based Afghan government, including the Taliban. Uh, uh, and I think that even the Loi Jirga mechanism would be acceptable, uh, provided the Taliban endorses it. I think, you know, normally I'm not in favor of a transitional government because it would be unconstitutional. Okay? But if Taliban were to agree to a peace process, then I think even a provisional government would become, an, uh, would become a, a, a lo almost logical and uh, practical uh, necessity uh, uh, to have that. Uh, I think there would be uh, lots of support for that proposition, provided the Taliban would clearly come up with this. Uh, Two years ago, we had a good start with the Taliban when they specified three conditions. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, developments in Afghanistan uh, uh, took different courses, and uh, we never got a chance uh, to make the Taliban expand on those or elaborate on those uh, uh, conditions so that we could uh, uh, get somewhere. I'll stop because... Uh, All right, thanks, uh, yeah. Dr. Sebahadi. Uh, Dr. Moradion, very short. I think two observations. There's a lot of uh, uh, negative view about the new... Uh, Trump new U.S. strategy, particularly the criticism that it has been heavily military-led years. In Afghanistan, I work with both Af uh, U.S. diplomats and also U.S. military. And when General McMaster was in Afghanistan, I worked with him uh, uh, on behalf of the Afghan government. And I found him one of the most sensible diplomats who happen to be a, a general here. Therefore, we have to resist that uh, a po a polarizing the diplomat as a nice people and the general as the uh, warmonger. That is not the case. The new security, uh, national security team of United States are far more sensible, f far more committed to a diplomatic and political settlement than the previous government because they have a perspective, the reality of the life. Yeah. That is my first observation. The second observation is about how we deal with the Afghan government, and that is related to the Pugwash. In international system, there are some sacred rules, and one that sacred rule is that we have to respect the sovereignty of the legitimate government. The Afghan government has a lot of short failing, failures, as I can list thousands of them as a citizen of Afghanistan. But that is the legitimately elected government accepted by United Nations. Therefore, any attempt for peacemaking should not be at the expense of, of legitimacy of the Afghan government. And the fact that you wanted to have a uh, conference, it has to have the approval of the Afghan government. If you invite Taliban, for, for that matter, for Iran, or China or Qatar here. They cannot treat Afghan government and Taliban as equivalents here. I mean, when I, before I came here as a citizen of Afghanistan, uh, I called the Afghan government. What is your view of that? Because I only go to any conference that Taliban attends if it is approved by the Afghan government. That is not because the uh, Afghan government is authoritarian government, no, not because we have to uh, strengthen the legitimacy of the Afghan government. And uh, I think a Pagwash or any initiative that we will always welcome that. We were very grateful for your goodwill. But in attaining an objective should not be at the expense of undermining the legitimacy of the Afghan government. Mike, please. Uh, microphone.
organize meetings, first of all, which are not, in, not formal. We are not peacemaking. We are trying to understand what can be done. Second, we always invite the Afghan government. And I always request, we always request to talk with them. We invite the Taliban, and that's the only place where we have discussion with them. The Afghan government was not answering to the question, and that's something which we cannot do anything. If the Afghan government doesn't want to answer, that means that they don't have the, the capability of blocking the discussions. This is not an official, this is not an official negotiation. It is discussion on what can be done. There is no resentment towards the Afghan government, no resentment towards anybody, but if the Afghan government doesn't want to send anybody to participate in the discussion, it's their decision. We are not in power to organize the solution. We are not in power to impose anything. We just are want to toss around ideas. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, Rostam Shaseb. <clears throat> Let me respond to the gentleman's question that Osama bin Laden was killed in um, Pakistan, Mullah Omar died in Pakistan, and Akhtar Mansoor also uh, died, was killed in, in, in Pakistan. The point is, Osama bin Laden was a recluse in Abbottabad. What could he do? Uh, he was a sitting duck, a very easy target, totally removed, totally excluded, totally had lost complete contact with anybody and everybody and had to be killed and was killed. The important thing is that if Mullah Omar was so important or his presence in Afghanistan was he, he came to seek medical treatment in Pakistan and died there. But upon his death, did the insurgency reduce or did it increase? It increased. Mullah after Mansoor was gone to Iran. On his way back, he got killed on the border by an American drone. The insurgency increased twofold. If you, if you mean to say that these two leaders were so crucial and they happened to be in Pakistan for different reasons, then the insurgency should have come to a halt. The insurgency is now twice as extensive and as intensive as it was in the days of Mullah Akhtar Mansoor or before him in Mullah Umar. What, what does that mean? That means the insurgency is indigenous, it is sustainable, They're creating, generating their own resources, their own volunteers, people are still prepared to, to lay down their lives for bad reasons or good reasons, but there is an insurgency which is growing and which is regardless of whether it is led by A or B or C or D. Many people don't, don't even know who is the present leader of the, of, of, of the, of the Mujahideen or the, the, the Taliban in, in Afghanistan. But they keep on fighting. They have no contact. They have no satellite contact. They are totally, every province has its own shura, its own uh, hierarchy. And they keep fighting according to their own program. So the, the death of a leader has not caused any dent in the insurgency, and this, I think, must be acknowledged and must be incorporated in our calculations to formulate a strategy. Uh, thank you, Rustam Sahib. Uh, Dr. Sahib, Farooq Azam, you would yes, like sir. to? Sir. Very short. Very good points he raised. Uh, so it is a stalemate because the Taliban is convinced they will not overrun capital in big cities and the Kabul government is not in the position to wipe them out. So it is. And the in presence of the Americans and the increase of American troops probably gave a little bit of uh, momentum to, to this as well. So uh, the, the, the question is how to solve the problem. It is the question. Talks for talks or talks for purpose, the question is, in uh, last year, April, not this April, it's April 28, I suggested to President Ghani that don't wait to others, talk to the Taliban directly. Of course, take Americans on, on, uh, in confidence and uh, try to, to convince our neighbors. And, uh, I mean, but this is primarily responsibility of the government to talk to the Taliban because that is a responsible ent entity. 
If there are difficulties in the Taliban are not hiking to the government or there are other th difficulties, find the solution, the ways. We have rich culture of, uh, of mediation. Our jirgas, our even women are, are quite instrumental in, in taking, going between two persons, two tribes to solve problems. And we, are, we are rich in this. So ask the nation to help to mediate between the government and the Taliban. If that doesn't work, ask the United Nations and at least find the solution uh, and the military victory for both sides is not uh, foreseeable. So the, the, the question is that how we can do it. The Trump announcement was not indicating this process, even not much processing, uh, promising. The, he, he dismissed the office that was existed, the idol office, not effective, and the special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And this was our, our view that he would say this, yes, he, I will increase fruits, the troops to Afghanistan and at the same time a political solution. And this is my office for political solution. And within a time frame, there must be a solution to Afghanistan and we go forward. I Thanks, mean, it sir. didn't that happen. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Sepp. Uh, Madam Rafael. Just two comments. Uh, one in response to General Durrani, which is to say that the United States does recognize that all of the things being equal, uh, the political solution has to come from the Afghans and the government needs to talk to the Taliban, the Taliban needs to talk to the government and so on and so forth. The problem is that all of the things are not equal and we are there um, and you know, I think most people agree for us to walk out the door and withdraw would bring a certain amount of chaos. So we're just trying to sort of help encourage that process along by understanding better the various parties. I think we understand the government well, the Taliban less well, um, which is why I've suggested we need to talk to them. Secondly, I'd just like to underscore um, uh, this view on the stalemate for uh, Rakesh Sood. Uh, a lot of analysis in the United States among serious people has concluded that, in fact, there is a stalemate. It's not a dead stalemate, but it's not really going to change much. So that condition, which I think is actually the most difficult is there. The other two, I recognize, aren't quite there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam. Despite that we are running out of time, but we have a very distinguished colleague of Pagwash, uh, Ms. Uh, Shiri Rahman. She wants to say something in Dinamar Khilsev. Just very quick, very short. I kindly wish up both of them. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I understand I'm late, and uh, my name is Senator Sherry Rahman. I'm going straight back into a joint session on uh, President Trump's policy as it was announced in Pakistan or, or about uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan or lack thereof. Very quickly, I'm looking to see uh, how many Af Afghans feel that there is a permanent and sustainable solution without Pakistan, number one, in the equation. If so, how? Uh, and secondly, uh, do, do Afghans feel that they too have to take responsibility for their soil because the question being asked from Pakistan and I, I will be asked this, did you ask who's taking responsibility for the terrorist sanctuaries that we are fighting off from our soil? We have one of the largest inland terrorist operations in the world running uh, in a country right now against uh, the TTP and others. And I understand that Kunar and many of the provinces of East and South Pakistan have been harboring these since I was ambassador to Washington. We regularly relayed coordinates but were given no joy. So how does this revolving door of terrorists uh, really go forward? And I think in the interest of being constructive, which I believe this forum is, has been, uh, I think there has to be, there, there needs to be serious thought on border management and intelligence cooperation. But given the vitiated atmosphere right now, the message we are getting is either from the Americans, is either you're at the table or, or you're on the menu. So that's what the Taliban are hearing and Pakistan is not the same as the Taliban. Pakistan is having to bring them at the table one day and having to bomb them off the, off the, off the charts the other day. And that doesn't quite work even by UN manuals for mediation. Thanks. Too many contradictions here. Thank, Thank you. you.
Amar Helse, very quick. No comment, just a, if you have any question. Uh, very briefly, I have a, uh, one comment and, and one question from Mr. Muman. The comment is, uh, the, we, everyone believe that the war in fight is a kind of impose by Afghan. It's a proxy war in proxy and the benefit goes to someone else. And plus we think that if we do not talk with Taliban, it means the Taliban will be replaced by ISIS. And ISIS agenda is beyond Afghanistan. The ISIS agenda is more, I mean, like, uh, is, is it they are entrusted to Central Asia. It means we have to talk with Taliban and we have to discuss and find a solution for Afghanistan. The question I have it from Mr. Muman is that. Uh, we are okay. totally out of time. That, yeah. That's okay then. Then I skip. I'm thank very you. sorry, I apologize I for running out of time this session, but thank you very much for your patience. Okay. Thanks.